like TV from other dimensions has a somewhat looser feel to it. Yeah, it's got an almost improvisational tone. Hey, how's everyone doing? It is time for Kahoot. Who all is here? I know we have people earlier. We've got a new background if you haven't seen it. We got Kahoot going right here. Who all is here live and ready to Kahoot? If you're watching in the chat, say, hey, Mubot. Mubot, time to give out some points. Mubot's got to give out those points. I Who's am all? Mubot. Wow, Mubot. Mubot is here. Who's here in the chat right now ready to Kahoot? Who's here in the chat right now ready to Kahoot? I can't even speak. It's so late at night. Ah, what time is it in Knoxville? It's 8 p.m. Knoxville. Let's see who's ready to Kahoot right now. Maybe we've got some former 320s. You never know who's going to show up to the Kahoots. Maybe Calzone Tyrone is here. Who is here? Do we have anybody? <laughs> I saw we had like six or seven people watching. So if you're in the chat right now, feel free to say hey. And then we can start Kahooting. Let's see. If you're here, jump into the Kahoot. Oh, we got one person. We got Green Pelican in the Kahoot. What's up, TH? Good to see you. We got Funny Ferret. Good to see you. There's two prizes. So right now there's going to be two winners. <clears throat> two prizes, two winners. That'd be really interesting. We'll put on the two-minute warning right now. Oh, we have three. Somebody's not going to win, but Smooth Bunny's going to win. Two-minute warning. Mandy, good to see you here. How's everyone doing? Make sure to ask questions while the Kahoot's going on. So if you have questions, let me know. We got Bright Camel. Four people. Half the people are going to win a prize now. Noble Pony's in the game. Noble Pony, good to see you here. Oh, we just saw some purple panda. Shining Wallaby. Got some horrible, horrible Australian impression. But good to see everybody. How's everyone's evening going? Feel free to say hey in the chat. So we're just chilling here. Minute and a half. What? Get ready for some stat tool and knowledge, some stat tool and exam to review. Going pretty well. It's pretty hot. Yeah, it's been pretty hot here in Texas. Pretty not so bad, I guess. You know, we got AC, so it's pretty nice. But we went out on the lake yesterday. It was overcast. It was like raining for a bit. You know what? I'll take the rain as long as it stays in like the mid 70s. That's awesome. Helpful Pelican here to help out. So TH, hope you had an enjoyable time with the heat. Try to beat the heat. Try to, you know, jump in the water. Enjoy your time. But it was really nice. We went out, paddled around a little bit. Witty Badgers here. We got eight people. 25% of people are going to win a prize. So hop into the Kahoot, barely under a minute left. What did everyone do this weekend? Besides going to the lake, what did you do? There's so much new Rick and Morty. Don't tell me about the latest two episodes. <laughs> like, well, why'd you mention it, Brian? Because I want to watch the new Rick and Morty. There's like a third episode I haven't seen yet. My fiance and I'll probably watch that. Maybe later. It'd be really great. Watch some Rick and Morty. 20 seconds on the clock, starting the Kahoot in 20 seconds. Remember, ask questions while this is going on. This is a great way to review. Check this out later to see the questions again. We got our new space background here. Went to the quarry and tried to learn to swim. Well, that's awesome. Great job. Enjoy it. Like, go out there, learn how to swim, practice up. Good place to go to learn how to swim. You know, enjoy with friends, you know? Well, awesome, TH. Genius hair. Uh-oh. We got a genius here. So it is time you heard the bell. We lost someone, though. Who'd we lose? Oh, no. We're starting here in like five seconds. I'm in the future though. We should be on ultra low latency, so we should be good. So let's get ready to go. Remember, ask questions in the chat. Here we go. Let's do this. You buy, you need to be giving out some points. Here we go. First quiz question right here is two events that can be easily added together must be what? Two events that can be easily added together must be what? So when you think about it, when I say or, like if I say, what's the probability you win or lose a game that can be easily added together. And if it's like, maybe you're good at the game. Maybe you're saying like, I have a good probability of winning. So I have an 80% probability of winning. The probability I lose is 20%. When we say the word or, what rule are we doing? You might say, Brian, some of these words sound similar. Oh, we tricked everybody. We tricked a bunch of people. What does mutually exclusive mean? So if I say something is mutually exclusive, let's think about what this term means right here. Don't worry if you got tricked. Don't worry. This is the practice. So when we say things are mutually exclusive, let's look at this. Mutually exclusive looks like this. So this is mutually exclusive. 
And this is the same. What's the difference between disjoint and independent? So when we say things are mutually exclusive, this is the same as disjoint. Does this make sense here that these events or these two things, like we could say here, you win or lose a game. And to say they're exclusive of each other means that they can't happen at the same time. Like it excludes winning if you lose. You can't win and lose. If you think about disjointed, they don't have a joint. If things are jointed like this right here, what if your parents told you this is, you can get a dog or a cat, but these are not disjoint events. What would it mean if I said you can get a dog or a cat, but these are not disjoint events? So I say you can get a dog or a cat and these are not disjoint events. What would this mean right here if these are not disjoint, which these are? These are not disjoint events right now. What would this mean? Like, how would you describe to somebody a not disjoint event? And this is why we can't add them because they have this overlap. You can't easily add them together. There's a way you just subtract the overlap. But what does this mean if your parents say it is not disjoint? So this down here is specifically not disjoint. And these are not disjoint and also not mutually exclusive. Um, disjoint and mutually exclusive are the same sort of thing. They're just two ways of saying the same thing. What does it mean if you, this is not disjoint right here? Like winning and losing is disjoint. Like you can see up here, you either win or you lose. And then we'll talk about independent here in a second. What does it mean if your parents say to you, you can get a dog or a cat and these are not disjoint events? Well, don't, don't worry about independent yet. So what would it, like you're saying, your parents say to you this, you can get a dog or a cat, but they tell you that it's not disjoint. Like there's an overlap. What does this mean in this region? In this region, this is the region where you do what? You get a dog, you can have both. Up here when it's disjoint, if you think about them as great job, Mary right there, if it's disjoint events, then you would say dog and cat, you can't get both. So we'll just do dog and cat for both these examples, where up top they are disjoint events, where if you get a dog, you can't get a cat. But the idea of the events not being disjoint is if one happens, the other can also happen. Is this making sense right here? Now, in which of these instances would we say it can't happen at the same time exactly? That's what mutually exclusive or disjoint, we can move the disjoint over here a little bit more. They're the same thing. It just means the exact same thing to say something is disjoint or mutually exclusive. Does that make sense? Like those are the same things. This is not disjoint. This is not mutually exclusive. And so when we have this right here, we cannot easily add them. But when we think about the idea of independent, there can be some collision between the two things, what we talked about right there, but let's just focus in on what independent means. If I told you uh, someone went out and ate cheeseburgers last night because they're awesome. I want some cheeseburgers now. So we go out and we say cheeseburgers last night. And we'll just say yes. Someone ate cheeseburgers last night. Yes. And do you think that would impact their exam score today or exam score on Wednesday? So do you think their exam score would be impacted by eating cheeseburgers with my Brian's brilliant handwriting? Just think about this theoretically, just be like, someone ate cheeseburgers last night. Do you think that would impact their exam score? Do you think that would impact their exam score? What do you think? I'm gonna write a word down here on the bottom. Do you think eating cheeseburgers? I don't think so either. Great job right there, Pooja. I would not think it impacts our exam score. We'd say it's independent. Does that make sense? We would say these are independent things. And what does independent means? If you know one thing, it gives you no information about the other. It doesn't, now, and you don't know for sure if they're not independent, but how about if I told you, like to do a not independent example, if I told you somebody studied last night. So I say somebody studied last night. Now we're not saying they ate cheeseburgers last night. I say they studied for the stat to exam, stat to one exam last night. Now you might say to me that them studying last night or their stat to one exam score is what? You could use dependent, or you could also say not independent. So they're dependent now. It's the same thing right here if we just change this to say that they are dependent. Like your exam score would be dependent on studying, which means if you know someone studied, that would give you information about what their exam score would be. You, you think it might be higher. So when you say things are independent, knowing one thing tells you nothing about another. When you say things are dependent, then knowing something gives you information. It doesn't mean you know the answer to the other, but it's like, 
uh, you say to your mom, can we go sledding tomorrow? And she says, well, that depends on it snowing. Now, that doesn't mean you will go sledding if it snows, but going sledding outside would depend on it snowing. And you, So just think about how dependent works right there. And when we talk about mutually exclusive and disjoint, these are when we use the addition rule right here to cover this question. We'll do a few more on these, but it's just starting to make a little more sense when you think about things being mutually exclusive is when two things can't happen at the same time. They don't have a connecting joint between them. You can see when these are not disjoint, you could just call them jointed because they have an overlap where you can get a cat and a dog. But up top there, these are disjoint because they have a disconnect and you can't, there's, you can't get a cat and a dog in that top example. If you get a dog, you can't get a cat. And this is when we use the addition rule up here, because you can simply say like the probability you win the game is 50%, the probability you lose the game is 50%. So it's probably you win or lose the game. Important thing to know that when you're doing this, this is the addition rule. And the addition rule requires that things are mutually exclusive or disjoint. Over here on the next page, we were talking just briefly about the independent rule. And if we are doing the independence, then we are doing the multiplication rule. So keep this in mind. So the multiplication rule requires independence, that knowing one thing doesn't tell you anything about the other. Let's go back to the coot and see who's in the lead. Please ask all questions you have. Let's go on to the next uh, the leaderboard. Green Pelican, it's a close leaderboard. Let's find out the next question. Who's going to win right here? Here we go. Maybe some multiplication rule. Two events that have no influence over the probability on each other are what? Good review right here. Great review. Two events that have no influence on the probability of each other. Kind of like, uh, you know, someone ate cheeseburgers and then you want to know uh, their exam score or the probability of eating cheeseburgers the night before the exam and the probability of passing the exam. Great job right there. Great job listening in. And that's what independence means. So I do cover some of the questions as we go through the review right here. Um, when two events are independent, knowing one tells you nothing about the other. Now I'm going to pause right here and give out some 50 points if we get it. What rule does this allow us to do? Go back to my, what we were just talking about. If two things are independent, we can easily what the probabilities together. So if two things are independent, we can easily what the probabilities together. What can we do to two independent events? What's up, Colin? Good to see you here. We're just throwing out 50 points for Colin appearing. Random Colin in the chat. And Pooja is correct. And I just went in and out of full screen. I got to rebind those keys right there. Good to see you. We just gave out 100 points. Awesome. Colin, you got to pull the quote. Mubot is always here. So, Colin, you could compete. Uh oh. We got to talk more about Disney. And I've got some huge, crazy big news. So, Colin, congratulations once again. And so good to see you. Thank you for swinging by. Here we go. I got I to gotta stop giving out points. Leaderboard is taking off right now. Leaderboard is just going crazy. Here we go with the next question. Let's find out. To multiply the probability of A and B, the events must be what? Review, review, review. You got to do things three times to make sure you know. That multiplication rule is, has, a, has a requirement, a condition that must be met to multiply two events. To multiply two events, and great job, Huja and TH right there. You are correct. They need to be independent. Now, if two things are mutually exclusive or disjoint, what can we do right here? Awesome. Yeah, that'd be a great con so much. What would we do if two things are mutually exclusive or disjoint? We can use the what rule. Like mutually exclusive means if one happens, the other can't happen. Like something like uh, it's 90 degrees outside today and it's snowing. Those probabilities are disjoint. Like it can't be 90 degrees and it can't be snowing. It's just a law of nature right there that those two things can't happen. So I could say, what's the probability it's 90 degrees or snowing? And I could say, well, like, okay, in this month, the probability of it being 90 degrees is like uh, 30%. And the probability of it snowing is like 0.001. So what's the probability of the two? I can do what to the two of those? What can I do to the two of these if they're mutually exclus exclusive or disjoint? If two events are mutually exclu exclusive or disjoint, I can do what to their probabilities? If two event events are mutually exclusive or disjoint, I can do what to the probabilities? Good review of probability right here. What can we do? You can put the symbol in the chat, just practice right there. So, oh, I think <laughs> it's gonna hide there right there. I think that was an error. <laughs> no, that's a problem. When you type too fast, sometimes you make those errors. You can always retract a comment if you didn't mean to, but I think I knew it. Yeah, don't worry. No worries. It didn't go through. <laughs> Continuing on, let's check out that leaderboard. Yeah, it's yeah, it's keyboard. 
tag more fast. Like, I got this. Let's throw 20 points out there for just going out, trying to get those points. Let's do this. Here we go. Leaderboard shaking up right there. We got Smooth Bunny right there. So let's continue on. Next question. Let's go to review times. The probability of a gross jelly bean is 25%. If you eat three jelly beans, what's the probability that they're all good? Now, this is a longer question, so I want you to listen in. You eat the first jelly bean. It's good. No, you're fine. I think I'm the only one who saw it because I'm a mod. You eat the second jelly bean. It's good. You eat the third jelly bean. It's good. So when you're doing this, you're eating the first, and it's good. You're eating the second, and it's good. You're eating the third, and it's good. Do you hear that and word? Now, do you think these jelly beans care about each other? The jelly beans don't care about each other. They're independent of each other. Key word right there. That the first jelly bean being good or bad is independent of the second jelly bean being good or bad. And the third jelly bean is independent of the first and the second being good or bad. Like they're not going to care if the first or second was bad. So what are we going to do to all these probabilities? Oh, no. <laughs> One person got it. Does anyone know the, who, who got it and who can show the mathematical equation? What was I alluding to, alluding to when I said the first is good and the second is good and the third is good? Do you hear the mathematics being done right there? Where I say the first is good and the second is good and the third is good. This is the multiplication rule right here to say what's the probability that they're all good. And I want you to think about this also. We have the probability of a gross jelly bean is 25%. What's the probability of a good jelly bean? Everyone figured that out but that's the probability one jelly bean is good. So the first jelly bean has a 75% probability of being good. So if the first jelly bean has a 75% probability of being good, and they're independent of each other, we can multiply. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. The first jelly bean being good is 75% because this is the complement, good review of the complement right here of a bad jelly bean. So the probability is one minus 25%. Great job, Bailey, right there, earning everyone another 20 points. Bailey, excellent work. Because this right here stands for and. And the jelly beans don't care about each other. They're independent. Excellent work right there. So what we have right here is the first jelly bean was good, and the second jelly bean was good, and the third jelly bean was good. Because the jelly beans, each of them are independent, we can multiply the probabilities and the probability stays stable that each one has a 75% probability of being a good jelly bean. Hopefully this makes a little more sense right here. One jelly bean has a probability of 75% of being good, but all three jelly beans have a probability of, and this can be written shorthand wise, make sure to email me if you win. Ooh, it's gonna be a tight game. It's gonna be a close game, 0.75. So what's the probability of eating 10 jelly beans and 10 jelly beans being good? Go ahead and put it in the chat right here just while you think about it. The first would need to be good, and the second would need to be good, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, and the eighth, and the ninth, and the tenth. Probabilities are going to get a little bit tricky right here, and they get smaller and smaller as you go down. So what's the probability of eating 10 of these jelly beans? Those are their, those really kind of crazy tasting jelly beans, you know what I'm talking about? The ones that are like, I don't know, like rotten fish. Oh gosh, that's the worst. I'll eat the toothpaste one every day. I don't even mind when I get the toothpaste one. I get the toothpaste jelly bean, and I'm like, I know what toothpaste tastes like. I'm good with this. That might be it. Uh, TH, you might be right. The answer is going to be mathematically 0.75 to the 10th power. There's my carrot symbol. So it's 0.75 to the 10th power. That sounds pretty close. Great job right there. Let's throw some 20 points out there for that answer. If that is 0.75 to the 10th power, you are correct. I can't do 0.75 to the 10th power in my head anymore. I could never do it. So let's hop back into the leaderboard and see who's winning. Here we go. Funny Ferret just jumping into the lead right there. This is going to be a crazy game, everyone. Let's see who's going to win it. The probability of getting a multiple choice correction question correct is 80%. What's With five questions, what is the probability you get at least one wrong? So you're going to take a five-question multiple choice test. And I want you to think about this for just a moment here. You could either get them all right, like you could get every question correct. Calculate that first. What's the probability you get the first correct? and the second correct, and the third correct, and the fourth correct, and the fifth correct. So that's one set of, event, of events that could happen, getting everything correct. Or, and this is the other thing that could happen, you could get at least one wrong. So as everyone see, we've got two things that could occur. You either get them all right, or you get at least one wrong. And this is where we're practicing the complement rule. By finding out the probability that they're all correct, which is one scenario, 
we know this probability is going to be the complement of at least one wrong. Because if you take five questions, you will either get them all correct or you'll get at least one wrong. And I'll write this out here in a moment so you can see it mathematically. But one of these things must occur. So we'll be thinking that over, like if I find the probability of getting them all correct, I can find the complement of that to get at least one wrong. So what are people thinking? Let's see. Time's almost up. So what do we need? We need the probability of getting them all correct, which is 0.8 to the fifth power. And then we need the complement of that, which is one minus 0.8 to the fifth power. So the answer should be, it's gonna be a smaller one. It's probably red. I think it's red. Oh, it's green. Was it probably getting at least one wrong? Oh, it'd be higher. Yeah, I reversed it. I reversed it. Oh, I see Brian's gotta do it right. I should have went, this is the probability of getting them all correct, I believe. Great job on all the people who got the green answer. Great job. Make sure you know how to do it and practice it. Even I get stuff wrong. Got to practice up. So what we said was, is there's two scenarios. And by two scenarios, this is 100% probability. You either get them all right, or, so now we're adding this, at least one wrong. So these are the two scenarios that can occur when you take this multiple choice test. One of these things must happen. So let's first find out the probability of getting every question correct. Well, if the probability of getting one question correct is 0 0.085, the probability of getting them all correct to reference the previous question is 0 0.08 raised to the fifth power. So now all we need to do is take 0.8 raised to the eighth power, and we go one, two, three, four, oops, I'm not doing it, two, three, four, five, and there we go. That becomes this probability right here, and now we need to solve for at least one wrong. So we're just going to algebra this over to the other side. I'll keep this here so you can see it. And when we algebra this over to the other side, we would get the following. One minus, which means it's the complement now. One minus of what we just found is the probability of at least one wrong. So we either get them all correct. Here, let's rewrite this so you can see it again up here at the top. So we either get them all correct which we found the probability for this. The probability of this was the probability of getting the first correct and the second correct and the third correct and the fourth correct and the fifth correct, all five correct in a row. And so we multiplied that out, found the probability, and then we find the complement in this right here. Once we take it and go one minus, then we have the probability of getting at least one wrong. And now we've solved it out. Is this making a little more sense to see this right here? If you think about it theoretically, that you will either get all the questions correct or you will get at least one wrong. And I put one right here because that means 100% probability. One of these things must occur. When you take a multiple choice test, you will either get them all correct or you'll get at least one wrong. It's not that you will get one wrong, you'll get at least one wrong. So finding out the probability of every question correct, 0.8 to the fifth power, the first is correct and the second is correct and the third and the fourth and the fifth, we can then algebra this out to solve out for what's the probability of at least one wrong. These are some of the toughest multiple choice questions, but try on your scratch sheet of paper to follow along with a process like this, where you step down through and you kind of write it out in theory. So that's a tough question. If you got that amazing work, that's a tough one right there. Let's see, next question. Who's gonna be the lead? Is this still Funny Ferret? <gasps> Funny Ferret, no. Let's find out who's gonna win though. Question number six, which of the following is a rule of probability? Q, Q, straight enough, no outliers, plot doesn't thicken. <laughs> which of these is rules of probability? I think we'll do pretty well on this question. Which of these is an actual rule of probability? Any ideas? Rules of probabilities. This sounds like we're talking about probabilities right here. States that the probability of A is greater than zero and less than one. So when we have probabilities greater than zero or equal to zero, something can only have a probability as low as zero, which means it can't occur. And something can only have a probability as high as one. I hate to say this, but when your parents told you to give 110%, parents were lying to you. You can't give 110%, you can't do it. It's not possible. You only give 100%. It's all right to say though. It's all right to encourage people. We, we have, we're fine with that. Just I'm just going crazy on my sound effects board. Let's go to the next question right here. Let's do this. Smooth bunny in the lead, practicing those probability rules. Let's find out. Everyone knows Morty and little dude out there. We got a second bunny. Don't know his name yet. He hasn't told us, so we'll figure it out one of these days. Here we go with the next question. Let's do it. 
A researcher selects the first 20 roads next to their house. What kind of sampling method are they doing? The first 20 roads, this researcher who's interested in potholes. They're trying to examine potholes in these roads and they say, you know, like, oh, wow. I already ruined my, my thing. I should have used it at this point. Everyone's like, I'm ready. Convenience sampling, that's the easiest way. So convenience sampling, have this on a flashcard, is when you take the first or easiest things, you go to campus and you say, let me talk to the first 20 people. The first 20 people is gonna be a convenience sample. This is not a proper sampling method. This is a bias sampling method. You'll get convenience bias out of this. Not a good idea. Don't do this sampling method. These methods are going to be true random sampling methods down below here, like stratified, systematic, and cluster. More on those in a moment. Leaderboard. Ooh, this is a this is a crazy game so far. We got three people neck and neck right here. Let's find out who's gonna win with the next question. How many questions are on, on the exam? Very similar to the first exam, I think between 40 and 50 or so. Each exam has a very similar format, how we do them. So yes, um, I can find out more exactly for if you want. Email me or I can check maybe after this, but great question, Mary. They're all very similar in format and very similar in length. Great question right there. A researcher surveys every fifth road on a list of roads. So they're gonna start from a random starting point to be exact. And then they're gonna survey every fifth road. Holy mackerel. <laughs> I think people memorize their sampling methods. Let's hope we keep up. We hope, let's hope we keep this up. But systematic is when you start at a random starting point and you sample every kth observation. That's kind of a key point for this. Start at a random point, every kth observation. And kth is just a placeholder for fifth, 10th, eighth, 12th. It doesn't matter what you use. It's just a placeholder for every blanked obser observation. Let's continue on. It's going to be a close game. I can feel it. Here we go with the next question. A researcher lists all the roads and randomizes the order and selects the first 50. Ooh, that first 50 might be there to trick you. So we've got here simple random sample, stratified, cluster, and convenience. They randomize the roads first. So they're making a random list of roads and then they're selecting the first 50. This was a question we had on the exam a long time ago and people got it wrong but this is a simple random sample. Sometimes people think it's convenience, but it's not because we're, we're still just randomly selecting the roads. So the way a simple random sample works is everything just gets a number and then you randomly select those numbers. Oh, no worries here. Let me show you, you can still join in. You bet, right down here. Thank you, Elizabeth, for hopping in. And I put the code in the chat so you can see. Join on in and play along. Practice makes perfect. Glad to have you in part of the game. So the simple random sample right here is when you first randomize everything, everything gets a random number, and then you randomly select those observations. It's like if you went to the registrar and said, let me have random students based on their ID number. So every student has an ID number, and then we randomly select those ID numbers. Can you explain simple random sample versus stratified? Yes, we'll definitely be doing some stratified here in a second. So for now, so, cause I'll do a stratified question. What are the rules of simple random sample? Step one is to give everything a what. So everything would need a what right now in simple random sample. In simple random sample, everything gets a what to begin with. Rule number one of simple random sample is give everything a this and then select those things randomly. So this is how we do simple random sample. Everything gets a this, so we can do it. Everything gets a number and then you select those numbers randomly. Think of this like uh, you invite everyone, you say, I'm gonna give out a prize. And then you put everyone's number in the bag and you shake it up and you pull out a number. That's the idea of a simple random sample. It's just everything has an equal opportunity of being selected, which is good, that makes it random. Equal chance of being chosen, exactly. And we're not doing it based on any characteristics, which we'll see with stratified here in a moment. So get ready, because I will cover it. If you don't understand, please let me know and I'll do more examples. But does it make sense how simple random sample gives everything an equal and likely chance of being selected you simply enumerate everything and then just kind of randomly draw numbers. You don't have to be pulling them out of a bag, but you could go to the registrar and say, uh, give me a hundred random students based on their ID number. So the registrar could go through and run a program that just takes 100 random student ID numbers. And that'd be a simple random sample of student IDs or like students to contact. So it's just, everything has a number and then they're chosen randomly. So everything has an equal chance. Great job, Elizabeth, right there of being selected. Let's see if we got the next one. So get ready, there will be some stratified. You will see it. Oh, purple panda. 
This is going to be a close game. Maybe it's stratified, maybe it's not. A researcher selects their sample based on the percent of highway, country, and city roads. So in this sampling method right here, we are acknowledging a difference. That's a key for this method. Maybe it's something we wanted to review. In this sampling method, we are acknowledging a difference to start, and then we are basing our sample on these differences right here. And we'll talk about some ways of this in a moment here, but this is a key thing to review right here. When we do this sampling, you got it. It's like, I knew it was coming. I was like, well, I don't have a question on it coming up here in a moment. So when you stratify, the first thing you do is what? Like, let's say we wanted to take a sample of UT students, but we said, you know, people's views on parking on campus might differ by this characteristic. What is a characteristic which we might want to be careful and make sure we don't get too much of one group versus too little of another group if we sample UT students and we want to get their views on parking. So I'm going to say, you know, we, I want to talk to UT students about parking, but I should probably make sure I don't over collect this group or under collect this group. I want to know what students think about parking. So what do you think would be a characteristic about students? And let's go over here to the sheets, the word documents. Let's go over here and think we've got UT students and we want to get their views on parking. So that's our, that is our parameter of interest. Key thing for later. The parameter of interest is what we want to collect on and commuter versus non-commuter. Great job, TH right there. Excellent work, earning everyone another 20 points. So commuter versus non-commuter. And so we might have that, maybe it's a little bit more, maybe like 30% of UT commutes and 70% does not commute. So this is non-commuter and this is commuter. So with this right here, when you take your sample, what percent of your sample, like if I go out and sample 200 students randomly, so if I sample 200, what percent of my 200, or you could say percent, it's really, really, good. I'm so sorry. UT, yeah, UT parking. I'm sorry, UT parking. It's not that good. I sadly must agree with you. Um, what? How many of these students should be commuter students? If you want to get the real view of UT students, and if these are the numbers, we're just pretending. We, you might be like, well, those Brian, those numbers are really off. But how many students out of the 200 should be commuters? And this is stratified. We're talking about stratified right here because we are acknowledging a difference. And then our sample is going to look like the population because we know that 30% of UT students are commuters, 70% are not commuters. And there we go right there, 140. So when we take this sample, 140 will not be commuters and 60 will be commuters because then our sample will look like the population. Does that make sense? Step one, acknowledge a difference. Step two, sample in accordance to that difference. So this is a key thing about stratified that people usually get confused on with the next one. You're not going to take all of this group. That would be a cluster sample. Cluster samples are when things are kind of logically put into groups and then you take all of the groups at one time. So you're taking a whole bunch. How do you buy a cluster of donuts? I like asking these questions because I just miss having donuts. So how do you get a cluster of donuts? How would you go get a cluster of donuts? Anyone know? Great job, Elizabeth, right there. I just like giving up points. How would you buy a cluster of donuts? How would you buy a cluster of donuts? Any ideas on a cluster of donuts? Any ideas? I took like Mubot, he can see the future. A cluster of donuts would be just taking a whole bunch of donuts at one time and not really acknowledging a difference. You would say, I bought a cluster of donuts. I bought a dozen donuts. We're not talking about type here because this is clustering at the moment. Clustering is just buying a whole bunch at one time. How about if you buy a cluster of soda? cluster of soda is going to be a 12 pack of soda. That's just a cluster. But as soon as you do this, as soon as you do this, what are you doing? If I talk about, let's say right here, diet versus regular, I think the diet pack might be dark color. So we've got here regular. What am I doing? If I talk about regular soda versus diet soda, what have I done right here by talking about regular versus diet? Now th those you might say, well, that's a whole bunch. Brian, you've got all the regular soda, you've got all the diet soda. That's a whole bunch. Well, what am I doing? And I'm doing the first step of another sampling method by talking about regular versus diet. And anytime you can pretty much say versus, what kind of sampling method are you doing? And then you need to make sure you sample these in accordance to their population percentages. If you do regular versus diet soda, you have now gone, gone into the realm of stratifying, acknowledging a difference. Because we're not talking about getting all the regular soda, 
all the diet soda. Exactly. We're stratifying on type of soda. Great job right there, Elizabeth. This would be stratifying soda because we're talking about a difference between them. But if we just look, literally say one 12 pack versus another, and we can't really have a difference between them anymore. Now they're both just regular old Coca-Cola. If you have 12 packs right here and you're talking about go get random 12 packs of soda, and we're just interested in like whatever soda brand this is, probably Coca-Cola because it's red, you know, what other, you know, Pepsi Blue. So um, if we say 12 packs, now we're just taking clusters of soda. We're just taking whole bunches. Clusters do not acknowledge differences. Clusters just take whole bunches at one time. And this makes taking samples quicker and easier. Rather than just taking individual cans of soda, we're going to go out. That's my best drawing of a can of soda. That's all you're going to get. <laughs> so rather than taking individual cans of soda, you're going to go out and take a 12 pack of soda, and then you're going to sample every can within that 12 pack of soda. More on that in a moment, maybe. Let's go back here to the game, see who's winning. Let's do this. Funny ferret jumping back up. Let's, let's see who's going to win. A researcher decides to take five mile segments, like a whole bunch at one time, and do a census within it by sampling every road. I'm not blocking the answer. So the researcher decides to take five mile segments, like a whole bunch at one time. They're not acknowledging any differences. They're just saying, let's go get a five mile segment of road, and then let's sample all the parts of it and use that as five samples. It's just a quicker way to get your samples. And they are doing what? So first off, they have things in groups. Great job, everyone right there, clustering. They have things in groups, and they're taking the groups at one time, and then they're doing a what on the group, a census on the group. Now you randomly select these groups, but here's a key word that I just said. Whenever you take these groups, you sample everything within the group, and that means you've done a what to the group. You can do this to the population, but I said it, so put it in the chat if you know the word, for you're gonna sample everything in that group. If you take a five mile segment of road, and you sample all five mile segments, you've done a what on the mile segments in the road. Or if you take a 12 pack of soda and you sample every can, you just gotta drink them all. You sample every can, I'm just gonna drink all 12 soda cans right here while everyone's getting the answer ready. What are you doing if you sample everything within a group? You're doing a what on that group, which is a key word to know. We oftentimes think about doing it on a population, but sampling everything within the group right there would do a what on that group. Give it a second in the chat for people to think about it. A census, great job, TH, right there. A census. A census is when you collect data on everything. We can do it on a group, like if this is a five like mile segment of road and we're interested in one mile segments, we can take data on each one mile segment. Or if we take a 12 pack of soda and we take samples on every can to make sure they're good, we've done a census on the group. We've collected data, great job right there, Bailey. A census on the group, collect data on everything. Who's in the lead? I don't know. Good job right there. The leaderboard's close. The leaderboard's close. The researcher takes too many city roads in their sample. I've confused people on these. Too many. These are different types of bias right here. It's a little hard to think about how this could be response bias. That's usually when the bias is in the question. Like if I say to you, do you think it's fair that 18 year olds can go to war, but they can't drink a beer? And you're like, that's not fair. I'm like, should we change the law? And you're like, yes, we should, because that's not fair. And I'm like, well, I've biased you. That's response bias. This is not response bias. This, interestingly enough, is under coverage bias. Even though we've taken too much, if you take too much of one, you take too little of another. So by saying you get too many city roads, you undercover other roads. So you don't want too much or too little. It's like going back to our previous example. What would you say to me if I got too many non-commuters? So I would think the commuters might have a problem, but imagine, we'll go down here, so that's the way the population looks. And if we were to go down here to the bottom and I said all 200 of my sample was non-commuters, do you think this would be a representative view of the population and their views on parking? Yes or no in the chat. We're 20 points here. We're just throwing out crazy points today. Do you think asking only non-commuters kind of oversampling and undercovering commuters, do you think that would be a representative view on what UT students think of parking? Maybe. We'll just talk to non-commuters. I agree with Elizabeth right there. No, definitely, you are correct. I do not think that would be representative. Great job, Kendall, right there. Would not be representative, and this would be an example of under coverage. I'm trying to think how we could throw some response bias in there. Be like, UT has the best parking in the world. Agree or disagree? <laughs> They're gonna be like, disagree, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, parking. No one ever likes parking. They're like, we know, Ryan, we, we understand. It's yeah. We, we appreciate you. A lot of great people over there. I think it's just, yeah. I'm sorry. 
I disappeared. They they canceled Brian right there. I said, nope, no more Brian, gone. Here we go, Green Pelican in the lead still. Let's find out who's gonna win next. Here we go. The researcher is unable to get information from certain roads selected. Ooh, what is this? They're not able to get information. They can't collect it. It's kind of a form of this when you think about things that don't respond. It's like you call someone on the phone and you say, hi, I'd like to ask you a survey. And they just go like that. And they just go, nope, not talking to you. Non-response. Non-response is when things that we don't get responses from, like we probably try to go out and get a response from it. Like we are like, let's go collect data on this. And then we can't get it. They might differ in ways. If we can't get information on a certain road and we're trying to collect on potholes, like how many potholes are in the road, maybe that road's a little harder to get to. Like if we can't go out and get information on that road, maybe those roads differ in the way they are compared to the other roads. And this would not be good because it's like, well, are we really understanding the roads in Knoxville if we want to collect data on all roads and which would be our population of interest and the parameter would be potholes on the road and then we can't get to certain roads if we can't get responses from certain roads well that would be a bias that would make it not representative when we look at the roads we have in our sample so this is not good we don't want non-response bias but you can't control that sometimes things just can't get responses from them <sighs> close game in the lead there we got some first second third close let's find out who's going to win the list of roads the researcher has access to sample these are the roads they can sample not the roads they do sample not the roads they're interested in, just the roads they could possibly sample. It's like if you go to the library at noon, every student in the library would be part of this. Like every student in the library at noon is a possible person you could speak to. And it's the sample frame. So the difference between the sample frame and the population is you might say, I want to understand UT students, but who are the only students you could speak to when you go to the library at noon? If you say, I want to understand UT students, so I'm going to go to UT library and you go there at noon. The only students you could speak to are the ones you have access to. So the sample frame is like a picture frame and anything inside of that picture frame, like I'm inside of it right now, anything inside of that picture frame is something you could theoretically sample. Now you want to understand the population, all UT students, but the sample frame are the students you could theoretically draw your sample from. You're not going to speak to every student in the library. You're going to speak to certain students. And the parameter of interest, also known as the parameter, is just what you're interested in studying. And if you want to know, what do you think about parking? <laughs> so the parameter of interest would be students' views on parking or the percent of students who like UT parking. And then all UT students is the group you want to understand. The sample frame are the students you could theoretically speak to. Like any student who's in there at noon is in your sample frame. But let's say you go up to a student and say, hi, I'd like you to take my survey. And they say, oh, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm, I, sure, I don't want to talk about parking. What did that student just exhibit? So that student won't be in your sample now. They're still in your population because you wanted to speak to them. And they were in your sample frame because you had access to talk to them. So the population was, you actually wanted to talk to that student because they're a UT student. The sample frame would be, well, you could have spoke to them because they were around you. So you had access to talk to them but they didn't make it into your sample because you didn't get information from them. So the sample is everything you have information on. They didn't make it into your sample because they exhibited what kind of bias by not responding to you. By not responding to you, the person did not give you information on the parameter you wanted to collect on, what you're interested in, and they gave what kind of bias. The bias they gave you for 20 points is what? Can't tell, it's all the points. What kind of bias did they give you? A review question. Non-response bias, great job right there, Elizabeth. Excellent work and TH, great work right there. Non-response bias, excellent. Great job, Hujo, right there. Excellent work. Next question, here we go. We got Purple Panda jumping in the lead here. I do not know who's gonna win. It's gonna be really close. The roads that the researcher samples. Promise it's not a trick question. <laughs> the ones they get as their sample. The ones they get data on. The roads they sample, the actual roads. They, they, they go to roads and they collect data on those roads. That would be their what? Not a trick question. <sighs> Wrong button at the same time. <laughs> Headphone warning. Uh, it's two buttons at once. Yes, excellent work, not a trick question. Remember, we've already used that answer. Hint for later questions. Sample's been used. That's just what you collect you, 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 you data, that's your sample. You collect data on those roads, well, that's your sample. Ooh, 
leaderboard movement on that. That's interesting. Some people were really quick. Some people thought it was a trick question. I promise I won't say tri not trick question. I won't try to trick you. Someone would be like, Brian, you promised. And I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> the roads the researcher wants to understand. The roads the researcher wants to understand. Oh, be careful. The roads. Oh, no. I am Mubak. Mubak, calm down. He got mad about that. He wasn't happy. So what is the parameter of interest? What is the parameter of interest? Sometimes the population is called the population of interest. What's the parameter of interest? I need someone to help me on the chat here. I need you to have a good definition for parameter of interest. So this is the group of things they want to understand, which is the population. And it could be called the population of interest. Could be called the population of interest. So it's the population is what they want to understand, but the parameter of interest is the what. And the key word right here is parameter. So the parameter of interest is the thing they are collecting on, not like the group, but if you want to understand UT students and you want to understand what they view about parking, then the population is going to be UT students. The parameter of interest is going to be what they think about parking. If we want to understand Knoxville roads, then the roads the researcher wants to understand is going to be the population where the parameter of interest is going to be what we want to understand about these roads. Does that make sense? Tell me in the chat. I can explain further. Um, would the parameter of interest be the area of the road they collect? It's going to be like the, like, like, um, how many potholes there are there per mile or like, uh, the percent of roads that have potholes. It'll be some sort of statistic that is going to be used to estimate the truth. We could say like, a recent survey showed that 10% uh, of Knoxville roads have a pothole every mile. Like, oh, sorry, I, that sounds kind of bad, but that would be the parameter which we're trying to estimate. Like, we, we might not know for all roads, but we're gonna collect data on roads to understand the population. We wanna understand the roads, and then what we want to understand about the roads is the parameter of interest. It's just a parameter might as well be called characteristic or the thing we want to know, the characteristic of interest. If we want to analyze UT students, we could say like, we want to understand UT students, they're a population. And then the what we want to understand about them is gonna be like maybe how much money do you spend on food a week? And that'd be the parameter of interest. So the average amount UT students spend on food a week would be a parameter of interest. It would just be the characteristic, if that helps you understand what this word is better, the characteristic of interest about the population. So this is some aspect of the population right here. So that you sometimes people even say population parameter of interest. Does that make more sense there, Elizabeth, to say that the parameter is just like a characteristic? It's something we want to kind of know about the population. So it's just a characteristic, I hope. Feel free to ask any questions. I try to stay on this for a moment because sometimes there's a delay in the chat. So that way people can ask a few more questions if they have them. But the parameter of interest is just going to be the thing we want to understand about the population. So awesome. You're welcome. Let's go to the next question. Some people getting some leads right here. Let's see who's going to win. The researcher is collecting the average amount of potholes per mile. That seems to be like what they want to understand. So the researcher is collecting the average amount of potholes per mile. And when they get this right here, they will get it as a statistic, which will give them an estimate of the parameter. So the statistic is an estimate of the parameter. Like if you went out and found that in your sample, the average amount of potholes per mile was 2.2. Well, then the parameter would be estimated would be, we estimate that in Knoxville, there's about 2.2 potholes per mile. I don't know if that's good or bad. Maybe that's amazing because a mile is a long way to not have a pothole. A little, little, little pothole, not big ones, not big ones. Going on here, the next question, let's do it. Probability of making a shot is 30%. What is the compliment? Not a trick question. The compliment, and we oftentimes use these for like P times Q over N square root. P and Q are complements of each other. Yep. A lot of times people ask me, we gotta hit the button. So a lot of times people ask me, how do you find Q? If you know the probability is P, well, if the probability of P is 70%, the probability of Q is 30%, vice versa. They're just complements of each other. Same works for P hat and Q hat. Just whenever you see like P naught, Q naught, P hat, Q hat, P, Q, they're always complements. And compliments just means the one minus the one value is the other value. So either you make the shot or you do not make the shot. And there we go. Probably trying to me make me trying to make the shot with the 30% probability. Probably worse than that. 
Next question. Ooh, everyone was really quick on that one. Here we go. The law of averages is a fallacy. The truth is what? Uh-oh. Long writing right here. Only one of these is true. If heads occurs too much, tails is more likely. Is that true? If you flip a coin, you get heads a whole bunch of times. Tails becomes more likely. The coin cares. Two disjoint events can be added together. Two disjoint events can be added together. Past events do not influence independent trials. Two independent independent events can be multiplied together. Well, there's some truth right here. So the law of averages is a fallacy. And this right here is the law of averages. That if like you're at the casino, um, you're going to average out. Imagine someone's like playing poker and they're like, I've been losing all day. I'm due for a win. Do you think the cards care? Do you think the cards that they have care that the person has been losing? No, you're not due for something because heads has occurred a whole bunch or you've lost a whole bunch of times. When you're flipping that coin, the coin doesn't care that heads have come up too much. If it's a fair coin, which is a key assumption, then tails would be just as likely on each independent trial. So the truth is, it's not the law of averages. If we have independent events, independent trials, then past events will not influence it. So over repeated trials, we will see the true probability, and this is called the what for 50 points. Like if I flip a coin to start, I'll draw it out. Who knows for 50 points in the chat. If I take a coin that's fair and I flip it, what is this called? When I flip a coin and I look at the percent of time it's heads, so on the first flip, it was heads. So 100% heads, and then it was heads again. And then it was tails, and then it was heads, and then it was tails and tails, and heads and heads and tails and tails and tails and heads and tails. And eventually I will see a graphic that looks something like this right here, that eventually it'll go towards 50%. If I carry this out for very high numbers, if I extend this out further to very large numbers, what is this called right here when you extend it out farther? You say, well, over repeated trials, we will see the true probability of an event. So if this is a 50% coin or a very large number of trials, like a law about large numbers, then what will we see right here if we go over a very large amount of trials and we look at the probability of an event occurring, like getting heads, where in our first flip, it was heads. This is the probability of getting heads. Well, we flipped it one time and it was heads. So... Yeah, it's 100% probability it's heads. It came up heads one out of one times. And then the second time it also came up heads. But then over repeated trials, got to throw the pen down. Over repeated trials, we eventually see the true probability. And this is known as the law of large numbers. The law of large numbers is very important because it allows us to estimate probabilities over repeated trials. And we could say, well, I mean, you do enough trials and you're going to see eventually what would appear to be a pretty good estimate of the probability. And as it goes towards infinite trials, it would have to approach the true probability because it's it's what's happening. It's what we're observing in reality. So let's go back here to, I'll throw out some points still. Do I have the 100 points? Oh my gosh, wait, I don't know. Ah, oh, random button. So there we go, 100 points in the chat right there. Let's go check this out. Here we go, hopping right back into it. Let's do this. One person got it on the leaderboard. Next question, here we go. We know UT is 20% freshman. We sample 200 students and 30 report being freshmen. What is N? What is N? N stands for sample size. N stands for sample size. So what is the sample size? Great job, the sample size is 200. These are gonna get a little bit tricky right here. Get ready for some tricky questions. The sample size is 200. Next question. Here we go. We know UT is 20% freshman. We sample 200 students and 30 report being freshmen. What is P? Careful. I'll give out hints at 15 seconds or so. P stands for the true proportion. So we have to ask, what is the true proportion? We know UT is 20% freshman. 200 is the sample size, 30 is X. 30 stands for the amount of successes in the sample, but we know UT is 20% freshman. So what is P? Have your calculator ready because there's gonna be a calculator one coming up soon. So P is the true proportion. What is this? What is 0.15? Who knows what 0.15 is? P 
UT is the true proportion. We know UT is 20% freshmen, so that's the truth right here. Does that make sense? So since we know UT is 20% freshmen, then P is this. What is 0.15? I'm going to wait. I think someone will get in the chat. Who knows what 0.15 is, which you probably got from 30 over 200, but that comes from a this. So 30 over 200 is not P because P is the truth. We know UT is 20% freshman. The sample portion, great job right there. TH, another 20 points. You are correct. That is the sample portion also known as P hat. Does that make sense? P hat is X over N. So P hat is just the sample proportion right here. How many successes we have in a sample. So we go right here and we do P hat equals X over N, which is the sample proportion. So excellent work right there. That is the sample proportion. Let's find out who's going to win with the next question. This is a tight game. I don't know. Top three is really close, but everyone else is within striking distance. Here we go. Have your calculator out. We know UT is 20% junior, 80% out of from 80 students, 30 are junior. Find the mean of the sampling distribution. This seems like a complicated formula, but it's not. The mean of the sampling distribution is what you would expect to see if you took a sample. We did a question like this during the weekly review today. So if you know UT is 20% junior and you took a sample, what would you expect to see? So listen carefully to that. If you know UT is 20% junior and you took a sample, what percent of juniors would you expect to see? Oh, only five answers. Great job. I think people were listening in. So the formula for this seems complicated, but it's just the following. All the formula for this is, and we'll do a new page right here, is we go here and we say mu p hat, which is the mean for the distribution of the sample portion, like what you expect to see when you take a sample. This is what you expect to see, the mean of it, like on average, when I take a sample, I would expect to see the truth. If 70% of students are non-commuters and you take a sample, what would you expect to see in your sample? Put in the chat, 20 points right here. If 70% of your students are non-commuters and you go out and take a sample, what percent of your sample would you expect to be non-commuters? So you know 70% of UT is non-commuters. You found that out from the registrar. You said, what percent of students are non-commuters? They say 70%. You say, I'm going to take a sample. What would you expect to see in your sample? Which I'm asking you about this right now. And you know that 70% are not commuters. UT told you this is the truth. You know this exactly. You would expect 70%. Does that just make sense when you think about it? Like, okay, I know 70% are not commuters. So if I take a sample in my sample, I'd expect 70% to be not commuters. Now be careful coming up here in a moment, we're going to see a different formula for the standard deviation. The standard deviation of P hat is equal to P times Q over N square root coming up here in one moment. So P times Q over N square root Q is the complement since P is 0.3. Q is going to be 0 0.30. I think I just reversed that. Since P is 0.7, Q is 0.3. Just one minus P is Q, vice versa. And then N is the sample size. So as N gets bigger, the standard deviation gets smaller. It's going to be a much smaller. Great job, Pooja, right there. And Elizabeth, 20 points in the chat. Awesome work. Let's continue on here. Here we go. Who's in the leaderboard lead? Find out now. Make sure to email me if you won. It's going to be a close game. Let's find out. We know UT is 20% freshmen. We sample 200 students and 30 report being freshmen. What is P hat? Oh, this is a good one. Not too crazy of a one. P hat stands for the sample proportion. So when you see P hat, you must say, what is the sample proportion? What is the proportion in my sample that were freshmen? In my sample, P is the truth. This is the truth. This is the sample size. This is the successes. X over N equals P hat. X over N equals P hat. X over N equals 0.15. Excellent work right there. Great job, everybody. It's overusing that sound effect tonight. Excellent work. X over N equals P hat. So the P hat is the number of successes over the number of trials. Great job practicing right here. Leaderboard's close. Here comes a more difficult question. Have that calculator ready. I'm going to give you five, four. Someone's running, getting their calculator. Three. They're the running back right now. Two, I can see it. You got it. Okay, you're ready. Here we go. UT is 20% juniors from 80 students, uh, 30 are juniors. Find the sampling distribution of the sampling distribution, standard, standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. 
the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. P times Q over N square root. P times Q over N square root. P, what's P? P is the true proportion. What's Q? The complement. Over N, the sample size. Now it's quantity square root. Don't forget that quantity square root. P times Q over N square root. P, which is the true proportion, times Q, which is the complement of it. I'm just doing one minus that. And if you want, you can go, uh, let me find right here. Let me go uh, copy this. One minus, oh, one minus 0.2. That is Q times P. Oh, P times Q over N square root. So I had on screen different one. That's all right. So round it up is 0.045 P times Q over N square root. We'll be using this formula later on for like P hat times Q hat over N square root and P naught times Q naught over N square root. This is for the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. Those other ones will be used in later chapters and feel free to, if you ever have questions, why are we changing it? A lot of times it's because we don't know the truth. In these distributions, we actually know the true proportion of juniors, but if we don't, we have to use estimates like P hat, or if we have a hypothesized amount, we have to use P naught, and that little naught on the bottom of it stands for hypothesized. Who's in the lead right here? Let's find out. It's gonna be close, it's gonna be close. Tell me if you want in the chat, I'm interested. Three more questions. For the sampling distribution of the sample proportion, what is the third condition? I'm gonna go grab something right here. Let's see. Let's go. Oh, do I have it up from today? I might actually have it up from today. Let me go over to the Discord. And let me, oh, success, failure. Great job right there. So I'm in the stat tool one. I might have to bring it over. Let me see if I still have it up from today. And do I? I maybe do not. That's a bummer. Okay, let me go ahead and copy this. Oh, wait, is this it? Here it is. Found it. Well, there we go. So this is my helpful little reminder of how to do the conditions. So we talked about this today during class, or not during class, during office hours, the review for this week. Condition one is random. Condition two is 10%. And then we have to ask, what kind of data do we have next? If we have categorical data, we'll be doing the success failure, which means we must have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. If we have quantitative data, we'll be doing the nearly normal or the large enough N condition, depending on if we're doing sampling distribution or if we're doing uh, confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. If we're doing the chi-squared test of independence, we will do the expected cell count. Now, what's really great is, is we're not onto a fourth condition yet, but with the color coding right here, you can see quantitative, when you have two means, has the condition of independent means. More on this in later chapters. And count data has chi-squared, or chi-squared has count data. There's chi-squared. Amazing handwriting, Brian. Great job. So if you want, take a screenshot of this right here or write it down to review. Once again, you can always come back and pause the videos, but this right here is all your conditions and color coding depending on what we're talking about here, just kind of a quick review. Always pause and ask what kind of data are we working with and then pause right here and ask, are we working with two variables? I have no idea it's gonna win this. Close game right now, close game. Let's continue on next right here. Top three in the lead. Let's find out who's gonna win. Two more questions. The probability right here, excuse me, we have heads and tails and we have a simulation. What percent of time do you get exactly two heads? So like a little bit of time on the clock right here. So when you look at this right here, heads is zero through four. So this would be heads, 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 tails, heads. Over here, you have tails, tails, heads, tails, heads. I'm just turning this into the simulation. And then over here, you have tails, heads, tails, heads, heads. Here you have tails, heads, tails, heads, heads. Here, luckily it's nice and easy. We have heads, 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 heads. So when do we get exactly two heads? Well, the good news is, well, sadly, all these probabilities are possible, but here we didn't get exactly two heads. To get exactly two heads, we have to have two numbers between zero and four, no more than two numbers. Like here are two numbers between zero and four. That might be it. <laughs> It was it. That was the only time right there. That was the only time we got exactly two heads. There's many ways to formulate this. How many times do we get at least one head, less than one head, which would be no heads, which right here, oh, I don't think we have that at all. So get ready for another formulation. 
And this question is going to decide it all. It's going to be close right here. It's going to be close. We got a big lead. So remember, first and second get prizes. Tell me in the chat if you won, and then make sure to email me if you won, and I'll send you the Amazon gift card. Here we go. Last question. What percent of the time do you get exactly two tails? So no more exactly two heads, exactly two tails. So it's the same sort of simulation to decide everything. Why didn't I get to be here? Oh my God, who's gonna win? Tiny Brian should win. Tiny Brian, you don't get to win. Why don't I get to win? You, you're not in stat tool one. I'm always here though. Oh my God, oh, seven people got that. Can I do this? <laughs> Let's do this! Here we go, Tana Brown I'm about to announce the winners. In third place, we have Smooth Bunny. Great job, Smooth Bunny. Second place, make sure to email real Brian. Green Pelican. Oh my gosh, this person really jumped to the lead. Whoa. Noble Pony. Great job. You can't beat a pony. Everyone knows that. I heard there's some guy running for president gonna give everyone ponies. That's pretty crazy right there. I don't know. Give everyone ponies. Tiny Brian, woo! <laughs> He's gone. Great job, everybody. Are there any last questions right here? Mary, did this help out? Does systematic stratified cluster make some more sense? We went over some of the sampling methods right here, but is it making a little more sense as we go through? Good job on the review, everyone. It'll show here the questions people missed and the orders. It like cuts the music early now. Maybe they start extending up. Oh. So here's the top missed questions right here, the most difficult questions. Um, definitely these ones right here, knowing some of the notation, notation's huge. Uh, we had right here, the roads the researcher wants to understand. That is going to be the population, the things they're interested in, like the things, the characteristic of the things would be the parameter of interest. Like we want to know, understand UT students. Well, that's the population. We want to understand uh, how old UT students are. That would be the parameter. And then up here, we have, uh, what is P? P is the true proportion. So that's something you would know about the population. Like if you know 70% of UT students commute then, or 30%, then that would be P in a different example. And then right here, what is the probability that all the jelly beans are good? That's the multiplication rule. And we can multiply them because they are independent trials of each other. So 0 0.75 times 0 0.75 times 0 0.75, because this is the probability that they're gross. And the probability that they're good is a complement. It's either gross or good. Any last questions? Great job, Pooja, Elizabeth, Mary. I'm trying to think who else was here. TH, great seeing you, TH. Let's let's put on a little music right here. We'll put on our 80s. No, put on a classic music. Ray, let's hop back to space. Let's do it. Here we go. Awesome stuff. New space scene. If you haven't seen it, gonna get some things worked up here. If you have questions, please email me. But are people feeling a little bit better about the test? How are people feeling? Last questions right here. If you have questions, let me know. Can't believe it's already 8 p.m. It's one of those big days getting ready for the test. One of my classes has a project due tonight. If you're watching right now, hey, what's up, 475? <laughs> project. Someone in the chat's like, I was just watching in the background, Brian. If you're here watching in the background, getting those points, good to see you here. Mubot, you want to say bye to them? You want to say bye, Mubot? Yes, I do. Bye, everybody. I sound like Tiny Brown a little bit. Wait, fix my voice, Brian. Okay, now. No, now we're in. Tiny Brian. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> okay, maybe right here. Let's fix this. Mubot is working on his voice. Two seconds here, everybody. Okay. Here we go. Okay, there we go. No. Okay, maybe. Mubot. Good. Mubot voice. Try this over here. How's this sound? No. Oh, that's negative. Robot. Robot. You got two roboty, two roboty. This is all right right here. New Mubot voice. I think this is what we'll do. I have a little bit too much fun, everybody. A little bit too much fun. But that's the way it goes here. Feel free to swing by anytime. You gotta do these things live, see how it works. You never know. Mubot's working on his voice right there. So with that, everybody, 
If you have questions, just swing by anytime. Feel free to ask, feel free to email, drop by office hours, and we'll be back here. Swing by, ask questions. Good luck on the test. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll talk to everyone later. Bye, everybody. Bye for now. You know what? Let's end with an outro right here. Here we go. You ready? Let's do an outro. Where's our outro set? Closings. Here we go. Time to end with an outro. Jason, we just need to film for another four or five hours. We've almost got these new intros ready. We're almost there. This has been going for like 20 hours. This ends now. <laughs>